Ah, uh, yes. Thank you. My name is Jack Perkins, and I bought these some while ago, and I think they're about ready for some new bottoms. All right, let me see. These boots can be repaired. I just need to write down a little information, and I'll be right with you. You know, that's how it all started, with a couple of very simple ideas. The first one, hunting boots with leather tops and rubber bottoms. Great idea. It had never been done before. The second simple idea was guaranteed customer satisfaction. Mr. Perkins, this is your copy. As soon as these are done being repaired, we'll send them to your home. Thank you very much. Thank you. Today, in one way or another, this Freeport storefront is the destination for literally millions of people each year. They arrive at this corner of Maine by car or boat, by telephone, by the internet. They come for sporting gear and apparel, outdoor necessities such as the one and only Maine hunting shoe, for gifts, for quality clothing for men, women, and children, for goods for the home, because this is the home of literally thousands of marvelous products. Perhaps most important of all, this is the birthplace of an idea. It is lasting evidence of Yankee ingenuity. This place is the embodiment of a way of life and of a tried and true way of doing business. A wise man once said, sell good merchandise at a reasonable profit, treat customers like human beings, and they will always come back for more. Well, this is the story of that wise man and the tradition he started. Because, oh yes, before there was an L.L. Beans, there was an L.L. Bean. In the late 1800s, Maine's Oxford County on the western edge of the state bordering New Hampshire was still sparsely settled. North of Portland was not much more than a cluster of farming communities, a few mills, a few merchants, a lot of wild country. Oh, the lakes and rivers were pure and clear, the forests were dense and rich with wildlife. The Civil War was over by this time, ending the national strife that had gripped every state in the Union. And the inhabitants of Oxford towns like Norway and Bethel and smaller communities such as Hebron and Greenwood were getting back to the business of everyday life. These were solid Yankees, hard scrabble farmers making their way by scratching a living from the soil, small scale merchants selling wares and services to other locals and to those travelers who were on their way through to points north and east in Maine and Canada. It was in one such family, in a farmhouse on Howe Hill in Greenwood, that on October 13, 1872, Sarah Sweat Bean gave birth to her fourth child, a boy, Leon Linwood Bean. L.L., as he soon came to be known, had been preceded in the Bean household by brothers Henry Warren and Otho Ralph and sister Inez Alice. He would be followed in 1877 and 78 by brothers Irwin Arthur and Guy Chester. It was also in 1872 that the patriarch of the Bean family, Benjamin Warren Bean, was able to redirect the family's livelihood away from farming by making the best of a bad situation in nearby Locks Mills. Late in the year, a popular local hotel and gathering spot, the Locks Mills House, had burned to the ground. In what can only be described as a spirit of early American entrepreneurship, something certainly not lost on the Bean children, the elder Bean entered into partnership with D.A. Coffin and Eben E. Rand, and by Thanksgiving of 1873, Benjamin Bean had built a new hotel and hall on the Locks Mills site. And the three local businessmen together opened the new Mount Abram Hotel. Well, by all accounts, the venture was a success. By 1874, Benjamin Bean had bought out his two partners. Though just three years later, for reasons not entirely clear in family history, 
Benjamin Bean sold his interest in the Mount Abram to former partner D.A. Coffin and moved his family to Milton. There, it is said, the Beans again became a farming family. While later L.L. would refer to his childhood as having been uneventful, the six Bean children, Henry, Otho, Inez, L.L., Irvin, and Guy, must certainly have lived a life in keeping with the time and place in which they lived. This was an era unprecedented in American history, a time that saw states added to the growing union, the invention of the telephone, the streets of New York City first lit by electric light. But far north in Maine, it was a time of hard work, family, honesty, integrity. The Bean family was no exception. It is certain that they passed along to their children their own ethics of hard work and community and concern for others and a deep abiding love of the Maine outdoors. Sadly, the uneventful life of the young L.L. Bean was about to change. Unexplained lingering illness was a common occurrence in those days, and the Bean household was not spared. In 1884, L.L.'s father became ill, hopelessly so, and Benjamin Warren Bean died on November 13th. The real tragedy for the Bean children, perhaps, was not just the passing of their father, but also the loss of their mother, Sarah Sweat Bean, whose own health had been described as delicate at the time, apparently paid dearly in the extended care for her ailing husband, and on November 17th, just four days after the passing of her husband, Sarah too died, leaving a local newspaper to recount. All the tender care and precious hope within the group of six lovely children and many kind friends could not save her. Her sister remarked that she seemed like a tired child anxious for a much-needed sleep. But for the Bean children, with L.L. in the middle at a mere 12 years of age and with the youngest barely six, life would move on. It had to. As was the custom of the day, the orphaned children were taken into the care of various neighbors and relatives. By 1886, L.L. found himself in the home of his uncle, Sylvan Bean in nearby West Minot. It was during these years that L.L. probably got his first real taste of hunting and fishing in the Maine woods. L.L. recounts in his autobiography, My Story, that trapping and fishing were a part of his life from an early age, but it was when he was 13 or 14 that he first saw a real hunting trip, and soon thereafter, saw the first glimmers of what could only be described as his own budding marketing genius. I went on my first hunting trip with a cousin, Louis Sweat. With borrowed rifles, we took the train from South Paris to Gilead and walked three miles to Hastings. Despite problems with a borrowed rifle and exhaustion that L.L. found almost unbearable, he and Louis each got a deer that year. The next year, we went four miles beyond Hastings. Louvi shot his deer the second day and went home. The very next morning, I shot a good-sized buck. Two days later, two unsuccessful hunters offered me $12 for the deer if I would take it to Hastings. I hauled the deer in my toboggan over the four miles of logging roads into Hastings, where I bought some salt pork, bread, and a pair of mittens and returned to camp. There I set out a string of six traps and caught four sables and one wild cat in ten days. Then I went back to South Paris with the fur and most of my twelve dollars. With skill and hard work, the young L.L. Bean had taken his own efforts and turned a fair profit, a lesson he would carry through life. Now, L.L.'s 1960 autobiography also quotes him saying of himself, my life up to the age of 40 years was uneventful, with a few exceptions. Well, perhaps so, but in the years that followed the death of his parents, L.L. began to collect the experiences that would make his life at the age of 40 quite eventful. He spent some of those years on the farm of W.H. Berry in East Hebron, 
and in 1891 he began his studies in the commercial course at Kent's Hill School in Reedfield. He arrived on campus with a scant $200 in savings. In what would become typical LL self-reliant fashion, he supported himself through school by selling soap. And when he completed his schooling in 1893, he worked for a short time in a butter factory in Bangor. But it wasn't long before his brother Otho asked LL to join him in a new venture, a shoe store in Yarmouth. And just up the coast a bit, the town of Freeport was in the beginnings of a rebirth. Once a thriving seaport town, home to ships' captains, privateers, and successful merchants, things had slowed a bit, and by the mid-1850s it was little more than a busy crossroads. But in the 1880s, it is reported, a local farmer, Edmund B. Mallet, Jr., brought his significant inheritance to town and set about building two big shoe factories. Around these larger businesses grew smaller ones. Sawmills, grist mills, a coal yard, a lumber yard, a granite quarry, and all the storefronts and small businesses necessary to support a growing coastal town. Perhaps Mallet was the first of the names that would long be remembered for bringing economic change to Freeport, but his successful development was instrumental in bringing a second long-remembered name to town, the name Bean. Growth and expansion seemed to be in the Bean blood, because by 1895, Otho reached beyond Yarmouth and opened a men's furnishing store up the road there in Freeport. He asked LL to run it for him. Well, LL was manager in those first years of the Bean Brothers Freeport store, and he struck out on his own with a dry goods venture in nearby Auburn. Then, on September 27, 1898, Freeport saw the wedding of L.L. Bean and Bertha Davis Porter. Their marriage certificate documents one of the many small curiosities of L.L.'s life. It shows his middle name as Linwood, and it's commonly accepted that L.L. was himself responsible for changing that to Leon Wood at some point in the early 1900s, and for reasons he never explained. Maine's own John Gould, who came to Freeport as a boy in the early 1900s, was a classmate of the Bean children and would soon gain his own national recognition as a Maine author and humorist. He remembers Bertha Bean and her history. Mr. Bean's first wife was a Freeport girl. She was a porter. And the porters were a sturdy, old-time Freeport family of the finest kind. Truly, Bertha Porter Bean was a handsome and substantial woman, well-educated. She had taught school and worked in a dry goods store before her marriage. She made, it seemed, the perfect match for L.L., an up-and-coming young man with a promising future. She was suited for this new role, guiding her family, the strong, quiet force behind a man, his business, and his ideas. And in marrying Bertha Porter, L.L. became a member of one of the leading Freeport families. The Porter fortunes and reputation had been made in shipping and mercantile, and by the time L.L. and Bertha married, there were porters behind many of the successful businesses in Yarmouth and Freeport. But for L.L., the connection to the expensive Porter clan was perhaps even more personal. Porter family members remember that L.L. seemed to find such comfort in their midst. All those Porter brothers, sisters, and cousins must have restored some of the sense of family the very young L.L. had lost with the death of his parents. By 1902, L.L. had moved his new family, now including sons Lester Carlton Bean, known as Carl, and Charles Warren Bean, known as Warney, up to Lewiston, Auburn, where he clerked for a time in the W.H. Moody shoe store. But important things were happening in Freeport and in the world. The Wright brothers had successfully piloted a powered aircraft. A man by the name of Henry Ford had founded a motor company. 
and the telephone was now an everyday reality. Freeport alone experienced a tremendous boom with some 50% of the town being wired up in just a few days in 1904. The Portland and Brunswick Street Railway would soon augment the coastal main railroads with a trolley tying Freeport to Portland in the south and Brunswick in the north. And though few may have realized it at the time, these were the beginning days of a new American society, one of travel, leisure, and communication. We were becoming a mobile country with time to spend away from work. Frank Small, who was born and raised in Freeport and would come to work with L.L. in the 1950s as a buyer of footwear, remembers the Freeport of the early 1900s. I, I remember Freeport as a, a very small, quiet town, uh, a good place to grow up. We had good times, always good places to play. John Gould also has fond memories of that earlier Freeport. Freeport was a pleasant little community. And it was about 2,500 people divided not equally between the village itself and South Freeport, which was the harbor. But the years were not entirely quiet for the Bean family. L.L. had returned to Freeport by 1905 to take over the store now run by his younger brother, Irvin. And in the summer of 1907, L.L. and Bertha added a daughter to their family, Barbara. The following winter was a memorable one for the entire Freeport community. Record cold temperatures, and on December 28th, when it was 12 below zero, fire swept through Freeport Square. A fire that leveled every structure between Bow and Mechanic Streets, leaving behind charred beams and business losses. Many of the town's most prominent businesses were affected, including the entire Davis block, which was the home to the Clark Hotel and E.B. Mallet's variety store. Even buildings across the street from the worst of the damage were not left unscathed. The Warren block, the building the Bean Brothers shared with W.W. Fish, Undertaker, saw its windows shattered and goods damaged by the blaze. As the town picked up the pieces and rebuilt, both Bean and Fish moved their businesses to the newly rebuilt Davis Block across Main Street. Now, no one knows for sure, of course, but is it possible that facing nature's fury of wind and weather on that wet winter day reminded L.L. of how much he hated cold feet? He had been fighting the elements all his life as a hunter and fisherman in the Maine woods, and in his own words. I grew tired of wearing shoes that hurt my feet. So I took a pair of shoe rubbers from the stock on the shelves and had a shoemaker cut out a pair of seven and a half tops. The local cobbler stitched the whole thing together. Rather like the oyster creating the pearl from a grain of sand, in 1911, LL created from a small idea the main hunting shoe. His first operation was his hunting boot. And uh, he never called it a boot, he called it a shoe, his hunting shoe. And he got the, uh, his feet hurt when he went hunting. And he was always complaining about his feet, they'd sweat. He developed this shoe, which was nothing but a man's, a gentleman's storm rubber to put over your shoes with a leather top and they were designed so to be comfortable. That was the main thing in the woods. They were waterproof, and they were. They were a comfortable boot to wear in the woods, and everybody wore them. Everybody in Freeport wore Bean's boots. Well, it wasn't long before L.L. realized that maybe it wasn't perfect, but he had something in this new hunting shoe. And not long thereafter, in 1912, two important things happened in Freeport. The first was that L.L. designed a four-page flyer depicting his new main hunting shoe, and he mailed it to a list of some thousand out-of-state sportsmen. L.L. wrote the copy himself, touting the shoe's superiority for keeping the feet warm and dry despite the weather, and listing the price, $3.50 a pair. 
You cannot expect success hunting deer or moose if your feet are not properly dressed. The main hunting shoe is designed by a hunter who has tramped the main woods for the past 18 years. We guarantee them to give perfect satisfaction in every way. The second thing that happened in Freeport was also happening around the U.S. as the United States Postal Service launched Parcel Post Mailing Service. So LL had all the elements right there. The pieces were coming together. He had a superior product made of fine materials by skilled main hands. With his catalog, LL found a way to reach people who would want those products. And now there was an easy way to ship. So the very first parcel mailed under this new system from the Freeport, Maine post office was a pair of L.L. Bean's Maine hunting shoes. L.L., it is said, received 100 orders from that first mailing, but his first production run was not entirely successful. As L.L. put it, using a regular shoe rubber and filling in the heel with felt wasn't sturdy enough. The idea was right, but the rubber wasn't strong enough to hold the stitched on tops. Sure enough, of those first 100 pairs sold, 90 came back. And those 90 shoe buyers got their money back every cent. LL knew he had something, so working from the basement of his brother's store, he tinkered with the design and finally contacted the U.S. Rubber Company in Boston to see about making a rubber bottom strong enough to hold the attached top. Well, U.S. Rubber could make what L.L. needed for the shoe, but the order had to be a large one and more costly than L.L. had anticipated. So he turned to family for support. He borrowed from his brother Otho and from Bertha's parent. And with those loans, he got the rubber bottoms he needed. Then he got Ted Goldrup to cut the tops. Ted's grandchildren tell the story of Ted bringing the hand-cut leather pieces home each night to his wife Gertrude, who stitched them together and readied them for the cobbler to attach to the sole. With that, Ted and Gertrude Goldrup became the first employees in the L.L. Bean manufacturing business. Gertrude Goldrup's white sewing machine remains today at L.L. Bean, a reminder of how it all started. Leon Gorman grandson of L.L. and the man who would lead the company from L.L.'s death and into the new century, looks back on those first hundred pair of boots made and ninety pair returned and sees the lessons L.L. must have learned. He learned three lessons from that first instance of, uh, of the uh, ninety boots being returned and that was to uh, in the future only sell first quality products that were fully tested, you know, in the field. Uh, second way to uh, offer, you know, superior customer service with a guaranteed satisfaction uh, service behind it. And then thirdly, he learned the uh, ability of the uh, catalog business to reach a national market uh, with a specialized product offering from Report Maine. And then uh, over Writing all of that was his belief in uh, treating his customers like human beings, which sounds pretty basic, but it was pretty fundamental to, uh, to his way of doing business. Well, business grew, and pretty soon L.L. found he needed to move his little manufacturing operation out of the basement. He rented the top floor of the Warren Block across the street from his brother's store. That move heralded another expansion as L.L. added hunting apparel and main fishing licenses to his sales line. By 1918, L.L. sold his interest in his brother's store to his brother Guy and followed his shoes across the street. It was the end of World War I. America was moving ahead. Freeport was about to see its first surfaced road as Route 1 wound its way north from Portland. Thanks in part to Henry Ford, Americans were discovering the automobile. Service stations sprang up along Main Street in Freeport to cater to locals and travelers alike. Meanwhile, with mailing from L.L. Bean making up nearly 40% of all the business moving through the Freeport Post Office, 
L.L. found it prudent to become the owner of the Warren block and thus landlord to the post office. L.L.'s business philosophy of plowing profits back into the business and into national advertising was paying off, and L.L. knew how to keep the Bean name prominent around Freeport. He and Bertha were known for their generosity, donating time and money to various organizations in town, including Bertha's church, First Parish Congregational in Freeport. L.L. even dabbled with a new sort of sponsorship, commercials. I remember we had a little Nordica movie theater, of course, silent movies in those days, and uh, there was no advertising about it anything, but the Bean Brothers did have a little trailer that ran every movie show, and it started out with a plug for walkover shoes, which was one of their trademarks that they sold in the store. That trailer stayed around for years, becoming damaged and shortened as the cracked frames fell away, but for years, moviegoers saw images of Bean's walkover shoes at least once before leaving the theater. And L.L. knew how to reach the out-of-state sportsman. One of his, his gimmicks was to go to the Boston Sportsman Show once a year and set up a little booth and he'd send down three or four of his office girls dressed to the nines. They were pretty girls, they were the best looking girls in Freeport. And they'd stand there and take, there were some attractions, they had some of Bean's products and they had a panorama of the state of Maine or Mount Katahdin or something like that. And people would come up to the booth at the sportsman show and Bean, get their names, get their names. And the girls would jot down the names, and this is how he built up his mail order mailing list. He may have been inventing as he went along, but L.L. knew mail order, and building that mailing list would remain forever important to L.L. Bean, so that everyone knew his repeated cry, Get their names! By the mid-1920s, as Americans were dancing to Charleston and listening to Will Rogers on the radio, as Ford was turning out its 10 millionth automobile, L.L. Bean's manufacturing business was sending out some 85,000 catalogs a year and pulling in more than $170,000 each year in orders by mail and telephone. By 1928, the busy Bean shop had added fishing and camping gear to the catalog and another staple, the chamois shirt. L.L.'s life and family were flourishing. The little boot factory that he had started in the basement of his brother's store now took up 13,000 square feet of space, producing items for a full 32-page catalog. The company was generating now fully 70% of the business at the post office, where by 1936, L.L.'s brother Guy was the postmaster, a position he would hold for the next 12 years, some of the best years yet for L.L. Bean. But before those glory days were to come, one thing that would be very important to the future of L.L.'s little company happened. In the waning days of 1934, on December 29th, L.L.'s daughter, Barbara Bean, now married to John Gorman, gave birth to a son, Leon Arthur Gorman. Of course, no one knew it at the time, but Leon would become the guardian of the legacy. Well, there was much more to come before the young man would have such responsibility. The 1930s also marked the beginning of the celebrity of Freeport. The town was growing its own in the person of Mr. Bean, and Mr. Bean and his little mail order business were in turn drawing the great and near great from many places to Freeport. Oh, it wasn't a fancy store, but it was Maine, and it was Beans, and it was where people came for quality merchandise and to see Mr. Bean himself, a man who it seemed always had a moment for anyone. Carlene Griffin, who began her lifelong career with Beans right out of high school in 1935, remembers the old L.L. Bean shop with its warren of offices and workrooms and stock rooms. As you go up the stairs, and you go in the first door. There are two floors, but you go, you're a customer, you go in the first door, and you see a lady sitting there who for many years happened to be me. Then you see three 
four men, three men stitching on hunting shoes, tops to bottoms, a lady in the corner uh, doing inner soles to put in the hunting shoes. Once you get up the stairs and you hang right, you're into the little office where you have probably six people working. Then you have LL in the front with his uh, secretary in front of him. You make the tin and you go out into the sales room, the one room sales room. It was before we put the Gorman building on even. And there you would find what he had to sell. So if you wanted anything, if you say you wanted a chamois shirt, even on the phone, if Anna took a, a, a call for a chamois shirt, somebody would have to go out in the stock room, which is right behind the sales room. The boxes were all marked, red, green, no, just, just tan at that time, with the sizes on the front, and you pick up the shirt and bring it out. Now, if you could see the way they do that today, you would be totally amazed. You wouldn't believe. In fact, I don't think half of the people in Freeport realize what goes on to send out a package from L.L. Beans. That walk up the side stairs was made by many, including an imposing young man who made his living down the road in a place called New York City, swinging a baseball bat for a team named the Yankees. Babe Ruth, an avid outdoorsman, became a regular at Beans during these years, as did others in the sporting world. Ted Williams was a regular. Yeah, Ted, Ted was glad to be more of an angler than he was a shooter. Uh, he was a, an expert flycaster, and he liked to go down to the uh, Narragages River and, and the Bangor Pool and catch salmon in the spring. As the reporter covering Freeport for the Brunswick newspaper, John Gould had gotten into the habit of regular visits to Mr. Bean's offices. He knew he could always find some bit of news during a chat with L.L. Another time I went in, John, oh, come in, come in. I got somebody here waiting to meet you. I went in, it was Jack Dempsey, a great big bull of a man, and he stuck out a hand as big as a ham and shook hands with me. And I sat down and got acquainted with Jack Dempsey. But it wasn't only the famous from the world of sports who made Beans a regular stop on trips north. Eleanor Roosevelt was a frequent visitor because they summered or they went to Campobello. And she would come in on her way up and sometimes on her way back. She loved the place. And Frank Small remembers one Roosevelt visit that was like so many others when L.L.'s booming voice let the whole town in on the happenings at Beans. His office was on the third floor of his building, and when he heard that Mrs. Roosevelt was coming, he immediately looked out the window and thought he should do something about that, so he saw the, the town's only police chief, and he opened the window and... Uh, shouted from the top of the building, Mrs. Roosevelt's come in town. Be sure that everything's right. That unmistakable voice distinguished the already distinguished Mr. Bean. And he was known for his ability to dominate a room and hold sway over his entire operation with little more than a word. My first impression was, he didn't scare me. Uh, but I knew he meant business. He was, his voice was loud. Uh, he told it as it was. He was quite firm, but he had the biggest heart in the whole wide world. L.L. Bean was uh, a big man, and he had a very loud, very heavy voice. And if you have talked with him even in confidence, it was hard to keep it confidential because he Never quiet, is it? Freeport had in so many ways come to rely on L.L.'s voice as a shopkeeper, as an active part of the workings of the town, even for an extra bit of information now and then. Every morning about 9 o'clock, his broker would call him as soon as the office opened in New York City. And they'd discuss the market and what Bean should hold and what he should sell and what he should buy. And uh, he had a booming voice. And he was a little hard of hearing, so he had an amplifier on his telephone set, just special for him. 
And uh, he'd sit up there in the office and talk on the phone. And if the window were open, which it would be on a warm summer day, you could hear him all the town. And it got to be the custom for the businessmen of Freeport to come over and get their mail at the post office while Mr. Bean was on the phone in New York. And they'd listen to what he was buying and selling, and they'd trot back and call their own brokers. But through it all, the man with the big voice and the even bigger heart never seemed to realize his own importance. An interesting thing about L.L. was that as he grew in, in fame, he never realized. And somebody would come into his office and want to shake hands with Mr. Bean, and he never really got used to the fact that he was a famous person himself. The late 30s saw more changes in Freeport. Bow Street got its first stoplight in 1937. Sales at L.L. Bean passed the one million mark that year. Sadly, two years later in 1939, the Bean family lost Bertha Porter Bean. In what would have been her 74th year, she died and was laid to rest near her parents in Freeport's Webster Cemetery. With her passing, L.L. lost what must have been the single strongest force in his adult life, the steadying hand, the beloved wife, the loving mother. Well, Bertha Bean was not an outdoor lady. Um, she was more of a, she was a perfect mother, made a wonderful home for, for L.L. and the children. Um, as I, and did a lot of uh, community work. Uh, she seemed to be always home. Uh, lovely lady, uh, sweet and nice, and I think they had a, a wonderful life together. Soon thereafter, in 1940, L.L. lost two of his brothers, Henry and Irvin. But life and business at L.L. Bean moved on as it had to. In those years, as many as 200 people were visiting the bean plant each day. Quite a lot for a small business that wasn't really operating a retail store. LL had to take time away from business for medical treatments in Boston. His eyes had given him problems most of his adult life. And there he met a registered nurse named Claire Boudreau. Well, in 1940, when LL was 68, Claire and LL married. And like many Mainers, the Beans began spending part of the year in Florida. Claire made a different sort of family for L.L. Many remember her as a positive force in his life, throwing herself into nearly all of his beloved hunting and fishing activities. Claire uh, was altogether different. Whether Claire really liked the outdoor activities, I don't know, but she always went. Wherever he went, she was there. I don't think it's because she did, didn't want to miss anything. I think she was interested in his welfare. If it hadn't been for her, uh, I don't know L, as L.L. would have lasted quite as long as he did. She was very, she was overly protective, but is that bad if you're going to prolong a person's life? The 40s and 50s were years of great progress at L.L. Bean, and they were true glory years for L.L. In 1942, he added another original item to the Bean catalog and in so doing became an author for the first time with his very own guide to the outdoors entitled simply Hunting, Fishing and Camping, which he wrote. To give definitive information in the fewest words possible on how to hunt, fish and camp. The little book sold an astonishing 200,000 copies in its first printing. But the fact that others found L.L.'s thoughts valuable should have come as no surprise to anyone because this was a man who knew his business well and knew the main woods and waters even better. In his case, the two went hand in hand, or foot in boot, if you will. And for years, as his business became self-sustaining, L.L. was known to take every opportunity to be in those woods testing his catalog products and being in the wilderness he so loved. After all, who wouldn't prefer a trip to a main river or stream or camp to a day in the office, no matter how hospitable that office might be? But still, without question, L.L.'s personal and professional legacy was being built and strengthened 
catalog by catalog, handshake by handshake. Some would remember a friend, a caring employer, a successful grandfather. I remember when we were, uh, my, my brothers and I were little, uh, every once in a while, my father worked for LL for uh, most of his working life. Uh, periodically he would take us to Freeport to uh, spend a day at the store and we'd have the run of the place and slide down the chutes and climb over the boxes and so forth. And then, you know, we'd go up to LL's office and, and uh, he always had a draw full of pennies that, uh, you know, he'd let us uh, dig around and, and get a few pennies to uh, buy a piece of candy across the street. And I know he always had time for, you know, us as little kids, even though it was the middle of his work day. And, well, I, I can remember you know, again, when I was young and, and uh, spending a day uh, in the factory, uh, seeing LL out on the floor, you know, waiting on customers and explaining a product to them, a fishing reel or something like that. And uh, he, he was always, uh, you know, again, outgoing and, and, uh, and uh, very service oriented and, you know, would do whatever he could to, uh, you know, make the customer happy. L.L. Bean also was uh, interested in uh, keeping the f different factories occupied. There were times when some, some of the factories would be shut down and there'd be no way of keeping them going unless they could attract new industry. And L.L. Bean was instrumental in making an effort for the town officers to offer tax incentives to bring new business into the town. He was a, he was a very hard working man. He expected uh, quality and he's a very kind person. He had uh, feeling for his employees if any of them were in trouble why he was willing to help. In fact, he uh, I know of, I know of one case where he assisted one of his employees in building a home and he always wanted to know how people were getting along. He was, he, he was, he was a very good man to work for. And L.L. was a very good man to do business with, even for those who might go about acquiring bean products in an unconventional fashion. The story is told around the company of a local boy who had visited the store day after day and fallen in love with a certain hunting knife. Now, this was during the Depression and lacking the money to purchase such a treasure, the little boy was apparently overwhelmed by his desire to have it. So one day he stole the knife from the store. Well, his mother found out about it and insisted that he face Mr. Bean in person, confess his crime, apologize, and return the knife. She said Mr. Bean would take care of the rest. The boy did as his mother told him, climbing that tower of stairs to Mr. Bean's office. The journey must have seemed endless as the boy crossed the room, shaking with fear, and asked to see Mr. Bean. With tears in his eyes, the little boy approached LL, explained what he had done, extended a trembling hand and returned the stolen knife to the towering figure in front of him. L.L. looked down at the knife and then at the tearful child in front of him and did something unexpected. He handed the knife back to the boy. He told him to keep it, to go home, that his mother was right, that by coming to the store to face up to what he had done, he had learned his lesson. After a moment, the boy realized, frightened though he was, he had done the right thing for having done a wrong thing. Was LL excusing theft? No, probably not. Was this a surprising moment for the estimable Mr. Bean? Not for those who knew him. He was a man of business, yes, but he was a family man. He understood the mind of a young boy. He dearly understood how it felt to be drawn so strongly to the Maine woods. Many was the day when he gave in to that passion himself, when the rising sun found L.L. and his hunting companions 
away from the shop or the office or the factory, off at a hunting camp, a place LL fondly called the Dewdrop Inn. Well, Dewdrop Inn was the name of many, many camps, and I don't know how many, but he, he'd pick up an old farmhouse, or sometimes an old lumber camp, and use it as a hunting base. And he had a number of them. He had one up to Wild River, where he was born. He had one up in Aroostook County, and he had a big, a good one at, at uh, Mount Abram in Kingfield. He had one at Flying Point. He had one at Sebago Lake. They'd use it until the building collapsed. They never did anything to the place. Then they'd find another one. And when L.L. wasn't out in the woods or on the water, there was always the shooting gallery. The shooting gallery was downstairs in the shoe store across the street in the clothing store. And it was a good shooting gallery. It was... Uh, when you shot, you stood at the back end of the store, and the target was under the sidewalk of Main Street. And if you knew what was going on and, and knew what you were listening to, you could walk past and hear these bullets under your feet go poop. Uh, if you happen not to know what you were hearing, <laughs> locals say that a curious passerby would be told that it was Fish the Undertaker just making sure that his customers were dead. In 1941, L.L. Bean was called to Washington to consult on the manufacture of cold weather boots for the military. Now, he was pleased and flattered to be able to share his knowledge of outdoor footwear, and he was pleased to see the Washington people come up and visit his place. But he had never been particularly keen on the idea of operating a truly retail establishment. Uh, Mr. Bean himself was always opposed to the thought of a retail store. He said, no, it costs me just as much to handle them across the counter as it does the mail order. And he says, I got the nuisance of having them around. So perhaps it was just giving in to his own successes, but 1946 saw the arrangement of a formal sales room in the middle of the factory and the installation of a night bell for sportsmen passing through on the way to camp and in need of supplies. Whenever that bell rang, L.L. or his staff always answered eagerly and graciously. Visitors today take for granted that the L.L. Bean store is open at all hours, but in fact it wasn't until 1951, the same year that Guy Bean passed away, that L.L. declared, We have thrown away the keys to the place. And with that, he ushered in 24-hour service at Bean's, which continues to this day. L.L. Bean was heralded in the 40s by Time magazine as the merchant of the Maine woods. His operations made headlines in newspapers and in the Saturday Evening Post. Back home in Freeport, select men of the town declared December 16, 1946 to be L.L. Bean Day. As an expression of its admiration, appreciation, esteem, and gratitude to the contributions made to the welfare and economy of the town of Freeport by Mr. Bean and to the prosperity resulting to the town due in large part to his accomplishments. Likewise, in 1947, the Cumberland County Fish and Game Association recognized the immense contribution L.L. had made to the area and outdoor sports, designating February 20th as L.L. Bean and Old Timers Night. In 1954, L.L. took a step he had resisted for some time. He opened a women's department in the Freeport store. It is said that it was Hazel Bean's idea, L.L.'s brother's wife, and she had kept at him until he gave in. In 1960, another idea was placed before L.L. This one he turned down. His old friend and customer, baseball great Ted Williams, had by that time gotten into the fishing tackle business. And Williams had the idea to combine his company with L.L. Bean. And he made overtures to L.L. about such a merger. He even asked L.L. if he would consider the outright sale of his company to Williams. But L.L. declined, and Beans remained Beans. Then in 1961, Leon Gorman found himself close to home again, finished with Bowdoin College and after a tour in the Navy, being processed out at Brunswick Naval Air Station. Now, he had never seriously planned to work in the family business, but circumstances intervened. 
I had no idea what I was going to do next. So I stopped to uh, talk with uh, Sam Ladd, who was a placement director at Bowdoin at the time. And uh, he suggested that uh, on my way home to Yarmouth that uh, I stop and uh, talk with L.L. Al and uh, see if he didn't have something to do for me. So uh, that's exactly what happened. I stopped in Freeport on, on the way home after uh, getting out of the Navy and uh, asked L.L. Al if he had a job because I couldn't go too long without a paycheck. And he said, sure, fine, uh, you know, you can start on Monday. And, uh, uh, so that's how I started it being. Uh, I had no particular assignment. Uh, he never told me what to do. Uh, but my father had died uh, six months prior to that, and they hadn't replaced him, so his desk was still empty. So uh, he, he had been the uh, clothing buyer prior to his death. So uh, I uh, started learning the uh, clothing business at my father's uh, empty desk. At a salary of $80 a week, Leon Gorman took that empty desk and dug in, learning everything he could about the bean operation. Again, Carlene Griffin, who was still celebrating her own employment anniversaries at Beans when Leon arrived in the 1960s. I saw him start on his journey, whereby he came in, started at the bottom, right at the very bottom where they made the honey shoe. But they did, he went through every single movement that you could imagine that could have anything to do with L.L. Beans. Throughout the 50s and 60s, sales at L.L. Bean nearly reached the $5 million mark. But as was befitting a man of advancing years, L.L.'s daily involvement at the store became less and less. He and Claire spent more of their time in Florida enjoying there the outdoors that he loved so much. After a long and fruitful life, having made a name for himself and having built a brand name based on quality and superior customer service, on February 5th, 1967, Leon, Leon Wood Bean, passed away at a hospital in Pompano Beach, Florida. He was 94. The death of L.L. prompted reports in Sports Illustrated, in Time, in Newsweek, on the NBC Huntley Brinkley report. The company received some 50,000 letters of condolence, and the store closed its doors for the day, something that had occurred only one other time, the funeral of John F. Kennedy. Just as the operation was starting to think about the future after L.L., and recovering from the loss, the company took another blow. LL's son, Carl, who had succeeded him as president of the company, died unexpectedly in October of that year. And the job passed to LL's grandson, Leon Gorman, the young man who had been learning the business from the bottom up since 1961. These first years in the president's seat would be difficult for Leon. Though he was not intimidated by the prospect, he remembers the difficulties of taking the reins after L.L. and Carl, two men who seemed, perhaps rightly for their ages, not terribly concerned about the long-term future of the company. But there was concern. Could L.L. Bean survive without L.L. Bean? Well, perhaps the thousands of catalog requests that came along with the letters of condolence were a good omen. We were concerned about whether we could uh, sustain the attractiveness of the business after L.L. All died. You know, would his mystique uh, go with him or would it somehow be continued, you know, with the business itself? Uh, and that was kind of the big concern uh, in 1967 when he died. It wasn't that we couldn't continue the business because we were running the business at the time, but when people didn't think that L.L. was personally still there, would, would we lose all of our appeal as a business? And, uh, and when he died, uh, we, we gave some thoughts to sort of trying to keep it quiet, but uh, it turned out that it was on the Huntley Brinkley uh, TV show for 10 minutes, <laughs> and uh, Time Magazine and all the major media carried his obituary uh, that the, the secret was out that uh, L.L. had died, but uh, 
as a result, and, and I can remember the number, we got over 50,000 letters of condolence uh, from people, you know, that saw the death announcement, and, and uh, most of them asked for a copy of the catalog. So uh, uh, the mystique had been institutionalized, and, uh, and we were off and growing from that point. The expansion has continued ever since with the creation of a corporate sales department, the introduction of credit card services, the development of a computerized mailing list in the 70s. L.L. Bean recorded a sales increase of over 40% in 1981, having sold more than 176,000 pairs of the main hunting shoe the previous year. By the early 1990s, sales figures at Bean's passed the $1 billion mark with more than 16,000 items in several catalogs and more than 150 million copies of those catalogs distributed worldwide. Leon Gorman has sustained the business and the legend, presiding at his grandfather's company as it broke into e-commerce and opened stores around the United States and in Japan. At the peak of the holiday sales rush, more than 10,000 people are employed at L.L. Bean at this company, this legacy, this little seller business that LL built from a good idea, determination, good business practice, and a bit of luck. In May 2001, Leon Gorman handed the presidency of the company to the first non-family member ever to hold the position, Chris McCormick, a longtime employee of Bean. McCormick takes over the legend with an unmistakable sense of what the L.L. Bean name means. You know, you can say it goes back to L.L.'s philosophy because he personally tested the products. And so the challenge for a company is how do you preserve that? How do you perpetuate that sort of philosophy? I think you have to focus on two points that uh, both L.L. and Leon um, stayed very focused on and perpetuated, and that's um, being entrepreneurial and innovative in business. So I think the challenge for me would be, how do you continue the focus to be entrepreneurial and to be innovative in a market that's so competitive um, so that you can succeed? What would LL think of this little shop today, you might ask? Well, as they bundled together their memories of the big man with the booming voice, how have those left in charge of the legacy of LL Bean, the man and the mystique, managed how will L.L. Bean be remembered? I think that uh, the, the core group of people that worked here in the uh, 60s and 70s understood the good things about L.L. Bean, even though they were slightly in disrepair at the time, and uh, on how to build on you know, the fundamental values of, of uh, practical products of you know, you know, excellent physical quality, superior customer service, and then this whole notion of, of trusting people and respecting people and, and being able to offer an unconditional guarantee, which actually was not being offered uh, when I came to the company in the 60s. When we instituted the unqualified guarantee in the early 70s. Uh, but again, these were all, I guess, built on the uh, nucleus of the, uh, you know, the LL values and, and, and uh, core core appeal that he had generated. As I go up there today, I think, this is tremendous. It's, it's so large. It's, it's so, so interesting. And without William Norman, it would never be this large, I'm sure. Well, I can't help but have a feeling of, of, of uh, being proud of having been part of this uh, organization and seeing the growth that has taken place. Think of the, the very small part I played. I always felt uh, pleased with the way things went. I think he'd be very pleased with the store. Um, he probably wouldn't recognize the store from the outside because we've expanded it so much. But I think if he were to go inside the store and look at the products and look at the people who work at the store, I think he'd be very pleased and I think um, be amazed at how much it's grown and how consistent in the values that he that he created the company, how consistent those are today. And I think that we have remained true to those values and looking at the, the products and the activities that we support in the outdoors, I think he, uh, he would be very pleased with that. 
Well, L.L. Bean was a symbol of integrity. And he lived by that and he believed in it. And he was right. I can just see L.L. now. This is in my, this is the way I portray it in my mind, right? He comes back here and he sees all of this. Now, he not only sees this building and all the outlet stores, he would be so amazed, I guess is a good word. But I feel in my mind the first thing he would say was, how'd you do this? As L.L. Bean himself said, Sell good merchandise at a fair price and stand behind what you sell.